You have a, a story, and as hard as it is to believe, your story is unspeakably precious to God. There is simply no lengths to which he will not go to redeem it. Nobody gets the story that we want. That's the tragedy. No story is over yet until it has been touched by God. That's the common good news. But then there is the larger, grander, breathtaking, unseen story that God is telling. And that's what I will talk to you about as best I can for the next few moments from Fred Beekner's book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel as Tragedy and Comedy and Fairy Tale. Once upon a time, there was a gray wizard who lived in a far country. Once upon a time, in a deep forest, there was a poor woodchopper and his wife. Once upon a time, a deep sleep fell upon all the inhabitants of the palace. Once upon a time, which is to say at a time beyond time, or at a different kind of time altogether from the kind of clock measures, or at a time that is no time because it is without beginning and without end, the Alpha and the Omega. Tell us a story, we say. Fred says that as far as he knows, there is no time, no culture which has not produced fairy tales. And they have certain things in common that have something to teach us that we'll think about for a few moments as you reflect on your life and that greater story that you might be a part of. One of them is in fairy tales, there's always another world. And the primary characteristic is not um, that it contains particular beings, elves or trolls or ogres or fairies or anything else. J.R.R. Tolkien, who we'll talk about more, he's got a wonderful essay called Fairy Stories on Fairy Stories, says that it involves the realm perilous. There is a transcendent world the writers of scripture are very clear that um, there are two great realities, the realm of what is seen and what is unseen, and that they believe that what is seen depends on what is unseen. Therefore, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen for what is seen, how your body looks, who's got the money, who's got the power, who's got the fame, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen, what matters most, love, character, values, God is unseen. And fairy stories remind us in a powerful way. And so we say, tell us a story that things hold together, that there is a narrative, that there is another world, that our world has been, in uh, the words of one writer, Charles Taylor, disenchanted, but that's not the way that things really are. Bigner goes on. The stories, do, uh, the stories that do not just tell us about the world of the fairy tale in and of itself, but tell us something about where it's located and how to reach it. Most, if not all of them, seem to agree it is not as far away as we might think. And under the right circumstances, not really all that hard to get to. The house where the children are playing hide-and-seek is just an ordinary house. In the story of Narnia, little children go through a wardrobe. They've been through it a hundred times before, but all of a sudden, for some reason, this time it leads them into another realm. Just as the tent where Abraham and Sarah laughed until the tears ran down their cheeks was an ordinary tent. Alice goes down a rabbit hole, but this time she ends up in Wonderland. Jacob, the grabber, the deceiver, goes to sleep in a certain place. We don't know where. Maybe he'd been there a thousand times before with a stone for a pillow. Only this time there is a ladder. Only this time there are beings that are descending and ascending from heaven. And Jacob wakes up and says, Surely the Lord was in this place and I was not aware of it. Seen it before. Didn't know. Didn't have a clue. Surely this is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Where is it not? So you look in your world for that today. G.K. Chesterton uh, has a wonderful word that he talks about in a book that he writes about, uh, where he's writing about Charles Dickens, um, more efoc. And he actually writes about the more efoc effect. If you could see it backwards, it's actually the word coffee room. Turn a couple of letters around. And another writer had actually been sitting in a room where coffee room was... Uh, spelled out on a glass door, but from the backside, it looked like a completely different and unrecognized word. And uh, so the, uh, the 
Uh, more EFOC effect is what's sometimes called defamiliarization. Taking what is trite, so trite that you don't even notice it anymore, and looking at it as though you had not seen it before, and seeing something quite remarkable that's always been there, but that you had not noticed. Bigdu goes on. It might be more accurate to say that the world of the fairy tale found them, and found them in the midst of their everyday lives and their ordinary world. It's as if the world of the fairy tale impinges on the ordinary world the way the dimension of depth impinges on a two-dimensional surface of a plane. So there is no place then it cannot become an entrance into it. You enter the extraordinary by the ordinary, like a wardrobe, like a manger. One day a stranger comes to town and says, repent for the kingdom of God, this unseen glorious realm upon which all that is seen depends, has come in your midst through me, this ordinary man, this carpenter. Um, one of the marks of this world is that it's quite a dangerous place in fairy tales. You choose the wrong path, you go through the wrong door, you say the wrong words, uh, you make the wrong decision, and disaster can result. And of course, our life is that way. I think about times in my life as a dad where I did things or said things or didn't do things or didn't say things, and I would give now anything in the world to have that moment back. And so often when that happens, it's not clear to us. We just blunder into it. The world is that way. Our world is that way. And that element of disguise of not being able to recognize clearly as part of our world. Um, in George MacDonald's book about the princess and Curdy, Curdy is given this uh, marvelous, wonderful, frightening gift where he can shake hands with anybody and feel from the feel of their hand the kind of creature that they are turning into. And he might be with something now that looks quite monstrous and ugly, but it's becoming a person of great beauty or vice versa. And we don't see. Remember years ago, being with Nancy, watching an old movie, Prisoner of Zedda, and Nancy's grandma Gladys was there. Um, she was well into her 80s by this time, treasurer of her Baptist church, was so glad that Nancy married a Baptist minister. She used to hound her to get up and fix me bacon and eggs in the morning. And there's a scene in the movie where the hero is ardently declaring his love for the heroine. I looked over and Gladys's face was beaming. I thought, that's the most beautiful face I have ever seen. But we live in a world where it is so often hidden. And that leads to one of the other primary aspects of the fairy story. Maybe above all, they are tales about transformation. Where all the creatures are revealed in the end as what they truly are. The ugly duckling becomes a gray white swan. The frog is revealed to be a prince. The beautiful but wicked queen is unmasked in all her ugliness. And Paul says, And we who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. Who is the Spirit that is the Unseen One? And this is the great story. This is what God is doing. This is what's happening. This is why your life matters more than you can imagine. It is perhaps this aspect of the fairy tale that gives the greatest power over us, this sense we have that in that world, the perilous realm, the other world, the transcendent world is distinct from ours. The marvelous and impossible thing truly happens. No one speaks of this quality more eloquently than one of the great modern masters of the fairy tale, J.R.R. Tolkien. He writes that the fairy tale does not deny the existence of sorrow and failure. The possibility of these is necessary to the joy of the deliverance. It denies in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. It is the mark of the good fairer story of the higher, more complete kind that however wild its events, 
however fantastic or terrible the adventures it can give to child or man that hears it when the turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beat and a lifting of the heart, near to or indeed accompanied by tears, as keen as that given by any form of literary art. Tolkien goes on to write that the gospel itself contains a fairy story, or perhaps the essence of all fairy stories, except that in this case, it is entered into history. One last note on this story. Rich Mao would sometimes read a little passage from the book of Revelation and then tell a story from his boyhood about the recognition of the unseen. The passage is Revelation 1, where John writes that he sees someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to, the feet, to his feet. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. This imagery would be familiar in that day. White hair was associated with wisdom. It was to be revered and honored. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. In his right hand, he held seven stars coming out of his mouth with a sharp double-edged sword. His words had great power, and so... His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, when I saw him, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Rich talked about a time when he was a little boy growing up in a little Dutch town in Michigan. And one day when he was at school, I think maybe in kindergarten, so like five years old, Santa Claus came and uh, wanted one of the kids to come and sit in his lap. And they were all sore afraid. And he finally called up Rich and Rich went to sit there and he was scared to death. He was trembling. And then Santa Claus pulled his beard away for just a moment. And it was Mr. Groot, a kindly, kindly man that Rich knew from church. And he said, hey, Rich, don't be afraid. It's me, it's Mr. Groot. John sees a vision of a being so powerful and glorious and holy that he faints dead away like somebody who had lost his life. And then Jesus pulls him near and says, hey, hey, John, buddy, don't be afraid. It's me, I was dead, but now I'm alive. And the keys, the access to all good, got them from my dad. That is the story that God has written, that God is writing, that God will write. Betting everything in the world on that story. And then my in many ways wonderful, in many ways so joyful, in many ways so deeply broken story will be healed by being part of that story. And it's closer than we think. So you look for it today in your life, in your stories, and above all in the people that you come into contact with and in their faces. For we are being transformed and the world is being redeemed. And that's the story. Hey, if you enjoyed that video, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any future teachings from John Orberg here at Become New. My name's Tim and I'm a part of the team here. This series is all about stories. Everybody has a story and everybody's story matters. And we wanna know about your story, whether it's a story of coming to faith or a story of spiritual growth. Whatever it is, we're here for you. You can email that to us at connect at becomenew.com or you can text it to us. You can also sign up for daily reminders whenever we drop a new video via text by texting the word become to the number 855-888-0444. You can also send us prayer requests there. There's a team of us that meet to pray each weekday for viewers just like yourself. If you'd like to receive the emails that go along with each video, be sure to check that out at becomenew.com slash subscribe. More than a video to watch, this is really a community to belong to, and we're so glad that you're a part of it. We'll catch you next time.